Hi, Johnny. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi, great to be here. So you're just coming off the close of your first cohort of uh, your new course, Nervous System Mastery, which I was lucky to participate in and uh, want to kind of dive deeper into that course and the materials in it and kind of what you learned from from running it. Um, but maybe just first to start out, would you mind telling me a bit about yourself and, and your own background and life story and kind of how you got to this point and you can answer in, in whatever detail or length you want, short, long, whatever, it's all good. Sure, well, um, yeah, thank you for, thank you for inviting me on here. And there is a, there is a, a pretty long answer to that, <laughs> to that story. Um, and, and I guess the kind of abridged version and we can kind of unpack this more if, if you want to, but I, um, I studied philosophy at university and kind of knew that I didn't want to get a, a corporate job in the city at the time. And two of my friends and I, uh, we had a travel magazine and we applied to a startup incubator in Chile uh, called, called Startup Chile. And they, it was basically a government, government run startup incubator and they gave foreign entrepreneurs $40,000 to fly to Santiago and start a business. And so that then became this company called Maptia, which was a startup that I worked on for about five years. We, we ended up working, uh, we went into, into Techstars, which was another accelerator in Seattle. And we became this kind of nomadic, um, nomadic startup. And we worked from Morocco and, and Bali and different places. And after about five years, I experienced a, a kind of a, a burnout, essentially. Um, I'd been working really, really hard for most of that time and uh, just needed to step away, kind of needed to, to take a break to do something else. And from there, I ended up um, you know, initially mentoring and then working with uh, an organization called Escape the City in London and working on their, their curriculum design for um, a, a, a program called the Startup Accelerator. So it was like taking people who were in city jobs but wanted to do something more meaningful, something more creative, and, and launch a business and I was kind of helping to design that curriculum and during that period I really um, just really discovered how much I loved the process of both crafting a curriculum and also the, ch the, the, the educational challenge of like how do you convey kind of information in the most interesting and fun and, and like delightful way um, and one of the pieces of the curriculum that I that I added that I thought was really important was this this notion of resilience and, and like we called it entre entrepreneurial mindset and resilience. Um, but it, it was really the kind of underlying psychology of like how how can you develop your mindset? How do you build self awareness to, um, to 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 make you an effective founder? But but really, it's about like how do you become a, an effective human? Like how do you um, navigate life is kind of what it came down to and and work and startups for me is almost just like a really efficient vehicle of um, surfacing your own shit in in life um, and so I, I did that for about three years and then um, a huge turning point in, in my life was I, I was engaged at the time and my fiance Sophie uh, suffered from bipolar disorder and uh, one morning when we were we were in different countries she she was at work and she had an anxiety attack and she ended up overdosing on her own medication and and taking her own life and that for me was a um it really threw me into the depths of of grief and just deep loss um and it was really the journey in the kind of two to three years after that that i kind of realized that there was this entire inner landscape that I'd essentially been, been unaware of. I, I kind of also tapped into a lot of emotions that I hadn't, you know, processed and felt. And I, I went on Vipassana meditation retreats, um, plant medicine ceremonies, vision quests, kind of extended time off. And yeah, it essentially kind of came to this place of, of realizing what I, I gave a TEDx talk called The Gifts of Grief. And, and it was essentially the about the beauty and about the connection that can be felt on the other side of these these painful emotions that um, I'd previously be, been very shut down from 
and I, I almost felt like I was kind of numb from the neck down without realizing it. And, and that's, you know, part of what led to the burnout previously and, and other challenges in my life. Um, so uh, lo lots of things happened during, during those years. But one of the things was um, meeting a, a guy called Jan Chipchase, who is now I consider him to be a mentor of mine. And we decided to kind of collaborate on these emotional resilience on, on this emotional resilience research and survey. And he, uh, we kind of put out this, this survey to a few hundred of mostly his kind of tech network people and, and decided to have a conversation around burnout. Like what were some of the causes? What were some of the, the costs of it in organizations, personal costs, emotional costs? Um, and, and we then kind of compiled this, this big report and that we that we published and we kind of open sourced it it was in a google doc so anyone could could comment anyone could view um and, and and this then kind of gave rise to the question of like okay well what can you know what can we do about it if burnout is clearly such a such a prevalent issue with so many so many costs both financially for organizations but also personally for relationships for um mental health all of these things and so from that came this series of emotional resilience workshops, which were kind of my um, m my attempt to bring some of the practices that I'd learned from meditation, from breath work, from working as a, a founder coach for a number of years. <clears throat> um, and and from those workshops, the, the, the piece that I think resonated most or the piece that people kind of kept on giving me feedback was the most helpful was the, the, the section on the nervous system and on like um, learning how to emotionally self-regulate um learning how to like, even be in touch with with how you're feeling and uh, feeling a sense of empowerment um that when kind of when anxiety or when these things surface that we're not a victim of those states but there are some fairly simple things we can do mostly using the breath that can kind of downshift our state to a place of more equanimity so yeah um, and then that kind of gave rise to this um this idea for a, a course called Nervous System Mastery, which, um, as you mentioned in the beginning, I just completed the pilot of. Um, it was a, a five-week course, and it was really my attempt to kind of digest and share a lot of what I've been learning about <clears throat> the the mechanics of the nervous system, um, and, and 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 really the the importance I think of learning to be in tune with our own internal landscape or something that is known as interoception in the in the kind of neuroscience um uh, yeah so I'll, I'll maybe i'll maybe stop there is there anything anything that you're curious to um unpack from that definitely yeah there's a lot there and um yeah i appreciate hearing that kind of context for for how you got interested in this and and makes a lot of sense about why it would be so important to you um Maybe I'd, I'd be curious to start just kind of by hearing more about the episode that you had of, of burnout in your life of, you know, um, that's a term that people use quite a bit these days and, and with good reason. But how would you describe your own experience of burnout when that happened? What was that like for you? Mm. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> describing it in, in retrospect, I think I'd describe it as as. I have this this image of like the the feather brick dump truck mm. uh, analogy and and the f the feathers are these things these like little bits of feedback that we often get from our body where we feel like something's not you know not quite not quite right um kind of mornings of of exhaustion things like that um and I'd say that mine was somewhere between a brick and a dump truck and it was just this it was kind of waking up in the morning with this sense of like real heaviness and this sense of like I cannot go on like this like this isn't how I want to be spending my time like my body needs to f a fully rest and fully recover and just just step away like it just needs some perspective it needs some rest um and and from a like now from a kind of neuroscience perspective I think I was I was in some state of what's known as dorsal vagal shutdown which is essentially part of the body's like freeze response and it's basically just like like a, like a numbness, like an apathy, like a sense of disconnection from my body, um, and this sense of like I, I'm not I'm not fully alive right now. <laughs> like something needs to something needs to change. And it was really hard because 
I, I was a co-founder and you know I had to have a conversation with my two co-founders of like I just I need to step away from from this startup um, and that was that was a very difficult conversation but um, the most important thing for me at the time was keeping uh, you know a very strong and meaningful friendship with with them and that that happened um, and so there was a kind of six to seven week handover period and I, I just stepped away mm -hmm. yeah yeah um do you remember subjectively what it was like for you at the time like uh you know part of your description was about like how you understand the research now of like oh this is was a dorsal mm -hmm. vagal shutdown but do you remember like any kind of vivid memories of, of what it was like at that time or how you mm -hmm. felt or like thoughts running through your mind or mm. yeah i i mean i think um people respond differently in, in these states and for me it was it was really struggling to find any joy or aliveness in, mm. in life so at the time it we were living in morocco in this mm. this beautiful surf town called tagazut and and even when i was surfing like the thing one of the things that brings me the most joy i wasn't i just didn't i just didn't feel it i just didn't feel alive there was this this lack of aliveness mm. and this this sense of disconnection from myself um that i that i felt and and with that a sense of you know, no real creativity no real um excitement for the future um and uh, yeah and and i think also like my a lot of my friendships and like meaningful relationships had kind of dried up as well and that, i think that's a another symptom mm, yeah right right um i'd also really love to ask you about uh the grief that you experienced after your fiance's mm -hmm. passing and uh i'll leave it to you to decide how how you want to talk about that and, and whether you want to talk about it but for me i'm mm -hmm. i'm sort of finding myself curious about uh um what that was like for you as well and what what experiencing the grief was like and mm -hmm. um you know you, you talked about how it having like unexpectedly positive emotions after you uh process that and what that was like for you and and maybe also um what what you would tell yourself uh now what what you would go back and tell yourself then about going through the grieving process um just because mm, it's a, it's such an essential human experience to to go through that with people and you know obviously quite specific circumstances for you with your fiance but um mm -hmm. something that every everyone faces and i would be curious to hear about your experience with that Mm. Yeah, I, I would I would love to share. And I actually, I had a conversation with um, Zach Stein yesterday, kind of on grief and on post traumatic growth, and, and like what is the what makes the difference between people that experience loss or tragedy in different forms and kind of stay stuck in that in that state versus those who are able to move through it. Um, and and I think for me, in, interestingly, I'd I knew people who were close to me who'd experienced kind of fairly deep loss, but not it had almost made them more bitter it had almost made them more um like in their own shell mm. and i think i was i was afraid of that honestly and i and i think <clears throat> initially there was this desire in me to almost like fully feel it and like face it head on in all the ways that i could think of mm. um which is interesting because it's kind of like my over efforting over achievement mindset of being applied to <laughs> the, the realm of feelings mm. but that's that's like how i how i began and the the journey that I went through personally was, I think, initially there was kind of um, stages of denial to some degree, which I, I think is almost my own self protection mechanism of not being ready to fully feel some of some of the things. And as I I, I ended up kind of visiting some of the places that were most meaningful to Sophie and I, and it was almost like each place held a different kind of energetic memory of something that needed to be felt, let go of, embraced. Um, and yeah, I, as I was visiting these places, it, it, there's almost like an invitation to surrender to whatever is present. And my experience of it was, was almost of being uh, like, like being in a, in a storm and this the, the waves of grief that come 
um, if if I can not resist the feelings, they they almost like wash away aspects of myself that I'm kind of clinging onto or grasping onto. Um, and then beneath that, there's a sense of connection. There's a sense of connection to my heart. There's a sense of of love. Um, and and I, I really love this phrase of, of grief is praise by, by Martin, Martin Prechtel, I think his name is. Um, and, and, and for me, one of the things that I, uh, I, I was kind of also grieving for the loss of, of Sophie, but I was also grieving for like the loss of the life that I'd imagined for myself for the next like four or five years, kind of, you know, all of the dreams that we created were almost like self combusted. And so the, the, the life raft that I had at the time, my, the anchor of my identity was almost shattered. And so there, there is this, there was this real sense of falling and this sense of like, like who, who am I essentially? Um, and with these powerful emotions, there was a point where, when I kind of stopped resisting the pain, um, it, it was actually very hard to distinguish between the joy and the sorrow. Like it, the, the, the difference was really, I think, only the story that I was telling myself, but the actual kind of somatic sensation of like deep, deep sorrow was almost indistinguishable from deep, deep joy. Mm. Um, and and, and I, I, I started writing poetry as well um, during that period. And yeah, I, I ended up writing, one of the poems was called The Heart Speaks. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think I can remember it. It was, it was like, joy, um, joy says, no, the, uh, I, <laughs> I've, I forget it now, but the, the essence was that to the heart, joy and sorrow feel essentially the same. Um, and, and, and I think also during that period, I, I learned how to ask for help as well. I kind of learned not to try and go through all of this completely on my own. And I became a lot closer to my parents and to, to friends and, and other family members. Um, and it really just, it really just opened my eyes to how, how disconnected I'd been from my, my body and my emotions and these, these deep feelings that, um, are kind of the source of the source of all life, the source of all creativity. Um, and from that wellspring, there was also a lot of creativity, as I mentioned, kind of a poetry that I, I self published a poetry book early, early this year. Um, and it kind of gave birth to a lot of, a lot of, uh, fer kind of fertile, created the, the fertile soil for things that came afterwards. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very, surprised to hear you say that the sort of experience of sorrow and joy were were similar and it's, it's almost like a a puzzle for me hearing that like a, I, i'm not mm. sure I, I know what you mean um what 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 was that like for you mm. there's there's one moment that really stands out when um i returned to a <coughs> a memorial bench that we'd made for for sophie and I remember um, as I was walking towards it, just feeling this like this swelling and this, this upsurge of, of, of energy in me essentially that was <clears throat> kind of around my heart and every step I took, the feeling kind of increased. And as I got to the bench, I just kind of broke, broke down and was kind of on my knees with my hands on the bench and tears streaming down my face. Um, at the same time, whilst I was, whilst it was, it was grief, I felt so, like my heart was blasted wide open. Like I felt so connected to myself, to the land, to, um, I felt so much gratitude for like the time that we'd had. Mm. Um, and, and although I knew the reason for the tears, like I've, I've also, ex like in days after I kind of started crying tears of joy like tears of like real life like tenderness of like this is just so overwhelmingly beautiful um and it was a similar kind of feeling <clears throat> of, of I, I i i suppose <clears throat> it, it's like feeling the impermanence of life and that can be beautiful it can also be sad 
but it's kind of that like deep tenderness of the recognition of yeah of life's impermanence mm. it sounds like if i'm hearing this right that like by opening yourself up to feeling the grief even though it's painful you also opened yourself up to feeling many other things including like gratitude for the time that you had together and gratitude mm -hmm. for just simple things of being alive and you know the wonder of the world and and that conversely maybe if you'd closed off closed yourself off to those feelings of grief that like you wouldn't have been open to feeling all those other things uh, does that sound along the lines of what you're saying <clears throat> yeah it, it does what i'd what i'd maybe add is that i i think what we typically and I, by we i mean like culture labels as grief and sorrow mm -hmm. i think is is often more the resistance to the flowing of that sensational feeling mm -hmm. and so when when we um and it's, it's i think it's also the same with anger and things like that but when it's flowing completely cleanly and when there's no resistance to the feeling and the emotion and the sensation i think for me it's very similar to grief is very similar to joy anger is very similar to clarity and determination like there's not really a difference it's more like we we've just labeled these feelings as bad and challenging because we typically resist them and when we resist them we get stuck there and that sucks mm. <laughs> mm. totally that's 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 my yeah that's my interpretation do you think that well you you quoted this as well this this phrase like grief is praise do you think that that's what was meant by that uh phrase or do you think there's something more there or, or what how do you understand that phrase hmm. the, fr <clears throat> the, the phrase comes from um i believe some uh, indigenous cultures who when when <clears throat> one of their elders passed they believed that the intensity to which they grieved was almost um providing the the fuel for that spirit to kind of get to the next destination Mm -hmm. and, and and they almost viewed it as like their responsibility to fully grieve for that loss um to for for that soul to kind of continue on with with its journey um yeah mm -hmm. it's it's a really beautiful the, the book i think is called the smell of rain on dust mm -hmm. um it's a really it's a really beautiful book mm -hmm. well i so appreciate you sharing what your experience of that grieving process was like. And I can imagine it being really tender. And I just appreciate hearing the wisdom that you've learned from your experience of it and you sharing that with us. So thank you for that. Thank you for asking. Um, I wonder if uh, in some ways that experience maybe has formed a basis of like inspiration or motivation for some of the work that you've done since then. Uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, does that feed into your intentions consciously in any way? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I think it it feeds in in, in a couple of ways. Um, I think one of the ways is that I there was a part of me that was almost like angry in a way that no one if whether my parents or teachers or or anyone like taught me how to feel intense emotions that it was almost like this thing that I had to <coughs> excuse me this thing that I had to learn for myself in my late 20s um and so there was this this inquiry of like I, I called it how to human like what are some of the things some of the really essential skills which lead to human flourishing human maturity and I think that was in some ways the impetus for the podcast that I'm now working on and I felt like my obviously there's a, there's a lot in that uh in in that arena and it's part of what the monastic academy I know is is working on um but for me I felt like I felt drawn to the arena of um increasing our own self-awareness and particularly I think emotional self-awareness because that was something that I really struggled with um and I think at the same time having a, a number of friends who also struggle with mental health um having lost sophie and, and just really being quite sensitive to the pain in which these these 
mental health conditions as they're kind of known as um cause and, and that really there isn't you know that bes besides some of the emerging psychedelic, psychedelic therapies there really isn't like a, a mainstream treatment for, for these things um and and i think particularly for me discovering breath work um conscious connected breathing i both f i i had this sense of like this can this can really really help people like this there's something really powerful here um and and i think initially it was my own curiosity of like you know what's here for me to discover and then in feeling the effects in in my own life this kind of desire to to share and and to be the bridge because i, I think it can it can be intimidating it can feel like quite woo it can feel quite like uh inaccessible if you're someone who's maybe you know working a tech job in the city and so with my background in tech i feel like i have the capacity to be a to be a bridge for people and to be able to speak the language of neuroscience to be able to speak the language of startup founders um, i felt like i was able to hopefully i uh, my desire is to communicate to those people mm, beautiful beautiful what uh, were the findings that you shared in your emotional resilience for leadership reports? Mm. Um, lots, lots mm -hmm. and lots. Um, part part of the motivation for it was, <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me, something in my throat. Um, no problem. Part of the motivation was w w almost taking this, I called it like the righteous trickster approach and, and what I mean by that was um, we set out to make the business case for investing in kind of burnout insurance, investing in this work of, of self increasing self-awareness of um, these, these kind of modalities that can, that can help with it. Um, and doing that by kind of really unpacking what are some of the costs and the business costs to organizations of having their CEOs burn out, of losing talent, of the effects on cultures. Um, and we, we definitely found that. And there are some really compelling, really compelling kind of quotes and data in the report itself. Um, but in addition to that, um, what, what I think I was surprised by was the, the average reply time for the survey was something like 35 to 40 minutes. Mm. So of the, the hundreds of people that filled this out, like pe this was almost like a self-therapy <laughs> session for a lot mm. of these leaders. And they, they, there were things, it's, it's all anonymous obviously, but things were shared along the lines of like um, a, a CEO coming home and, and disciplining his kid a lot more strictly because he had this kind of um, pent up anger that, that wasn't released. There were... Um, the loss of friendships and partnerships and relationships. There was like horrific kind of health impact in terms of people getting diabetes, their feet swelling up, um, being unable to get out of bed for weeks or months at a time. Just these like really um, pretty heart wrenching stories from people. Uh, and, and and many people also felt like they hadn't fully recovered. They kind of got to the point where they could then, you know, begin to function again and then going back to work um, and really not knowing how to move through that place and feeling unsupported and also feeling like useless and, and guilty, I think, for what they'd experienced. Hmm. Hmm. What were, did you make any kind of recommendations for what either individual leaders or organizations should do to prevent burnout? Yeah, we, um, well, I compiled, um, I called it like a resilience wiki and it's actually still available if anyone's mm. curious. It's resilient.wiki is the website. Um, and the recommendations varied from kind of ideally seeking a, a therapist or a coach kind of initially, I think having um, someone to kind of guide you through this process. Well, th th there's, there's almost two stages. The first stage is identifying kind of where you're at. And if you're at the point where you just need to step away and rest and recover, that's kind of the first step, like if it's that bad. Um, but then there's also the, the process of when you feel sufficiently resourced and sufficiently regulated of going into the kind of um, painful or challenging experiences through 
therapeutic modalities that could be a somatic therapist it could be could be breath work it could be you know for some people it's plant medicine um and and and, and there's almost this like uh <clears throat> There's, there's the task of relieving what's known as allostatic load and allostatic load is what is kind of built up in the nervous system where there is a lot of um essentially wear and tear when we spend too long in in a high tone sympathetic state which is essentially the kind of anxiety feeling maybe there's anger up there but it's like we're turned we're on the whole time and we struggle to to come back down then our body isn't able to get access the rest and digest which is the the parasympathetic which is the ventral vagal and when we're in that high tone sympathetic it's really demanding on the body and so um there's initially that <clears throat> that phase of, of recovering and i i think having a meditation and mindful practice is really helpful having a a, a journaling practice is really helpful um and obviously things like sleep and, and nutrition are, are super important as well um, and yeah, th there's a number of recommendations on that on that wiki as well if people want to check it out. Hmm. And were there any kind of system level recommendations that you'd make to organizations? Yeah, I mean, it's um, the the thrust of our survey was focusing more on what are the costs to individual leaders, mm -hmm. but from from that, um, both both the realization that the the nervous system of the people in the leadership team kind of trickles down to the culture and so if the leaders are in a state of dysregulation it's very likely that's going to kind of trickle down into the organizations so i think the first thing is really encouraging leaders to kind of embrace this work and to kind of take this really seriously and then in terms of in terms of kind of culture um what were some of the things that came up? Um, kind of it, empowering employees to like, giving them a, a budget that is kind of specifically allocated towards however they choose to rest, recover, to learn about these things. Um, and, and I think giving giving explicit permission is a big part of it. I think a, a barrier to resilience is the the guilt that people feel. Um, and this is particularly true for founders who, who you know, feel like they need to be working around the clock to so their company doesn't die. But actually switching that to like, like needing to invest in themselves, be that a great executive coach, be that um, long weekends in nature, these things to fully recharge so that they can have a, you know, a more filled cup to, to give to their company. Mm. Um, and yeah, there were lots of open questions that were left in the report which people commented on with various ideas everything from like four day work weeks which i think has pros and cons um kind of thoughts around vacation uh yeah there's there's a lot there to unpack and it's i think that's probably going to be the the next area of research that we that we go into mm. um yeah mm. yeah i'm getting the sense as you speak about it of like i don't know sometimes people like mock tech companies for you know providing all these things for people and like um maybe it's just seen as like a a, a perk or something uh mm. uh kind of trendy or something like that but i'm getting the sense just from hearing you speak of it of like uh it's almost just like good good sense to do that um uh, certainly from a business sense i can imagine but also just like uh a broader sense of like having a good <laughs> working human endeavor rather than just like trying to make as much money as possible but just like hey if this thing is going to work if if humans are going to uh collectively do something together then it makes sense to take care of our people and and help them thrive yeah. rather than just like be working under adverse psychological conditions yeah absolutely and um there's, there's a number of companies i think Basecamp generally is a pretty good example of a company that, that mostly does this pretty well mm. um but I do think that some of those perks can just be kind of lip service if the if the underlying culture is one of um, like we just need you to produce at all costs. And mm -hmm. if we if we're not truly appreciating you, if we're not valuing you, if we don't want you to be here for five or 10 years, um, then I think it, it you know it will feel like lip service in, in, to some degree. Um, so they're not a an alternative to kind of the deep cultural change. And I think that deep cultural change requires people in leadership to really get it for themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Totally. And you, you spoke as well about how the um, sort of genesis of the course was coming out of the report and, and the specific interest that people had in the nervous system. Um, maybe for people that haven't taken the course, like, can you speak about uh, how the course is structured and, and kind of give an overview of what it what it is composes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, th I think the the one of the the foundational pillars of nervous system mastery is cultivating this term that I mentioned earlier, which is interoception, which is really being aware of, of what it is that we're feeling as, as often as possible. Mm. Um, and this might sound strange for people, but um, the, the, it really is a capacity that we can develop to be in tune with kind of little muscle tensions, with emotions that might be arising, with uh, just all of this data that our body is giving us every moment in time, learning how to tune into it and listen to it and kind of trusting that wisdom is is really foundational and <clears throat> the opposite of interoception is extraception. And I think that a lot of us have learned to regulate our state, to regulate how we feel using external substances. So like in the morning, if we feel sleepy, we'll drink coffee. If in the evening we're feeling anxious or we can't relax, then maybe drink some alcohol, maybe smoke some weed, wh whatever the, um, whatever our habits are. And I think my goal for this was to re-empower people to shift their own state just using their biology just using their breath just using their their bodies um and kind of re relieve them of that necessity to to take external substances so so that's that's a big part of it um and from there we kind of go in like week week one is talking about nervous system fundamentals it's talking about functional breathing and kind of the, the difference between nose breathing and mouth breathing and things like that. And then week two is protocols for cultivating calm. So really looking at that side of self-regulation that helps us drop down into genuine rest and relaxation, which I, I think was probably one of the most popular <laughs> weeks um, among students. The, the third week was around increasing alertness and, and energy and looking at protocols which <clears throat> kind of upregulate our nervous system. Um, and get us into kind of healthy sympathetic tone <clears throat> and then week four which was um you know could i think be a course in itself was looking at emotional fluidity and resilience and for me there's a this is something i'm still trying to um, like think about how to best share but the difference between self-regulating in the moment so kind of if we feel anxious we can do things to kind of calm us down but then there's another approach which is almost going into the emotion so the times when we get triggered the times when we feel anger um, there are practices and protocols for going deeply into the emotion and allowing it to kind of surface and um, this kind of gets into the work of um, trauma release of incomplete uh, incomplete reflexes and this is something which i i feel is so so important but it, it also can sometimes require um, having a trusted guide or a, or a somatic therapist or a breathwork practitioner to kind of guide you through. And so um, I, I, my hope was to share some of the principles and some of the um, kind of almost like create enough curiosity for people, for students to like want to go and explore this for themselves. Mm. Um, and then <clears throat> week five was the, the idea was to create your own human operating system. So kind of bringing all of these practices, these protocols um, together into a, a kind of playbook that you can then um, live your life by, <clears throat> and as, as well as doing a an audit. <coughs> Let me take some water. Um, doing an audit of your, of your environment and kind of being aware of the different stresses and the stimuli that are coming in. And, you know, things like, really simple things like replacing your light bulbs with with amber lights or using candles in the evening um just kind of making these small changes that do do make a difference to your nervous system in the long run hmm. what uh it seemed like there were kind of two branches of the course uh like the theory of the nervous system and helping people to understand that and then also mm -hmm. specific in, in sort of interventions that you were recommending mm -hmm. um and i'd like to ask you about both of those and so just to start like what what were the sort of um 
you've talked a lot about interoception, of course, and uh, you know, I know you spoke as well about like uh, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, wh what are some of the other like main sort of theoretical points about the nervous system that you were hoping students would walk away with kind of a deeper understanding of? Mm. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so a few come to mind. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the first is the difference between top down versus bottom up protocols. Um, top down protocols are typically using the mind to try and impact the state of our body. And these are things like um, <clears throat> many, many types of mindfulness practice or meditation, not all, but certainly, certainly a lot of them. Um, versus the bottom-up protocols, which are things like breathing practices, which change, our, which literally change our blood chemistry, and the change in blood chemistry changes uh, the thoughts that we have, and it's it's just generally much more effective. Like if we're, <clears throat> there are many many reasons for having a meditation practice, but I think if our goal is to just calm down and, and relax, then breathing practices something like um using vu hum or alternate nostril breathing or even simple cadence breathing is a much more effective way of doing that and and so it, it was this difference between top down and bottom up was one of the the foundational kind of principles um <coughs> let's see yeah and and i, I think the other piece was <coughs> Um, really understanding the relationship between <coughs> the way that we're breathing is impacting the way that we feel and the way that we think. <coughs> Give me a sec. I'm going to just have a, have a good cough here. No problem. Um, yeah. And t to give a, and, 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 and our breath can be a, a cue for our interoception. So for example, if right now I'm breathing into my chest and my breath is, is shallow and maybe through the mouth, that is going to be having an impact on my blood chemistry and is going to be creating a kind of high tone sympathetic state. So my heart rate will be higher. My vision will be more narrow. My voice might be slightly higher. I'll have less access to the kind of range of, of tones. And then conversely, if my breath is, is in my belly, if it's through my nose, if my belly is relaxed, then I'll be in parasympathetic state. And that's the state where I can um, you know, be more be more social. It's when I can digest food. It's when I can relax. When I can um, often think more clearly. And so, just and and again, that has corresponding shifts in blood chemistry, which creates those conditions. So, I, I think one of the foundational pieces was just how breath awareness gives us insight into our state of being. And and we can also you know you use wearables. I'm a big fan of of the aura ring, for example, as a way of getting additional data and getting feedback to kind of confirm and validate how we actually feel but again it comes down to like what are some of the ways that i can check in on the state of my body and my physiology on a on a regular basis and then make decisions from that place um so i, I had this phrase of like if this then breathe like if if feeling um anxious kind of in my head then do this breath if feeling sleepy brain fog lethargic then do this breath and so you can kind of make decisions based on how you're feeling. But to do that, you need to really be aware of what's going on in your body and not trying to, to overcome it or push it down or, or just ignore it. Mm. Uh, going back to this distinction between bottom up and top down, uh, I'm just out of curiosity, like what are the meditation or mindfulness techniques that you've been exposed to that you would describe as being top down? I would say um, mantra-based meditations, for example, T things like TM, mm -hmm. where you're just kind of in your mind repeating a phrase or a mantra. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> potentially some of the, the dharana concentration practices where you're you know, folk meditating on, on a candle, um, meditating on... Um, e even meditating on your breath to some degree can be top down but then it that i think that also bridges into um like, like I, i'd say vipassana is probably a good example of a of a bottom-up practice to some degree but then you can also um I, I think the difference for me is 
is the emphasis on I'm trying to do something like I'm trying to use the mind to control my body or am I am I like listening to what's alive hmm. and so um, if your practice is just kind of sitting there um, and tuning into your body and like listening that's beautiful I think that is a I consider that to be a bottom up practice mm -hmm. but the way that a lot of people try and I think approach meditation it is through that lens of trying like they're trying to um, use their mind to tell their body to like relax <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 they're, and so their breathing isn't changing and so their physiology isn't isn't changing hmm. yeah I think I think the the meditation practices that I've been exposed to that have been functionally useful for me have been uh, effectively bottom up uh, where they're mm -hmm. based in the body and uh, yeah. they, I think you know, there are mental strategies that are helpful but um, mm -hmm. I think the most effective techniques that I've done have been ultimately based in the body and and sort of bottom up in the way that you're describing it it's not mm -hmm. yeah I think there are definitely techniques that are more top down and then also it seems like instructions are variable as well just like how is it taught and is it taught mm -hmm. in a way that would actually um, lead to like beneficial causal effects or, or not yeah right right yeah and I, I I mean I'm I'm definitely a fan of a lot of top top down practices mm -hmm. particularly things like um kind of a, some good self-inquiry meditations or, or, or journaling prompts mm. can use the mind to get into um, an emotion that we're afraid of feeling and once we've connected with that then we can go into the body and we can kind of follow it and we can tune into what's really there mm. um, so it's almost like it's great for eliciting some of the the things that we might be unaware of mm. Mm. and sort of on the practice side you mentioned a few things but what were some of the interventions that you uh sort of recommended in the course yeah so um in week one the the protocol or the main practice was cadence breathing um which is is just a kind of a simple even inhale and exhale through the nose and into the belly mm -hmm. um and and this kind of is another point around uh, and this is something that James Nestor uh, writes about in his in his book Breath in a really compelling and eloquent way. But many of us have dysfunctional breathing patterns just just generally, and so retraining our default breathing to be into a soft belly and through the nose in itself makes a huge difference. Um, and then the kind of real time interventions, um, things that I, I've experimented with with a lot, and the ones that I keep returning to for myself are. Uh, the first one I call Vu Hum, which is, it, it's similar to chanting, honestly, in, in a lot of meditation practices, but it's essentially like Vu, so you feel the, I place my hand on my belly and I usually feel a little vibration there, and then mm, and you feel vibration uh, usually in your nose or behind your eyes, and that vibration, we, we, we have these um, nerve endings for our parasympathetic system in both our, our kind of neck and in our lower belly. And so the vibration will actually stimulate and activate those parasympathetic nerve endings. And on top of that, the, the humming creates a release of nitric oxide, which is also a vasodilator and um, promotes, again, stimulation of the parasympathetic or rest and digest nervous system. So th those two are very effective. And then also I, I like to use alternate nostril breathing, which is essentially inhaling through the left for three and then exhaling through the right for six and having the extended exhale is also another um another trigger for the parasympathetic nervous system and this is also something used by professional freedivers for example before they they dive down they want their heart rate to be as low as possible and they'll use these extended exhale breathing practices to just really really calm their body down um because the, the the exhale is related to the the parasympathetic um, side of the nervous system. Hmm. That's fascinating. I, you know, one of the most powerful techniques that I did through meditation, which came came from the Zen tradition, is uh, they called it the extended exhale or uh, sasokan, which means counting counting breaths. But uh, you, typically, you would do it well. It, it would be taught initially with <clears throat> counting, but uh, the <clears throat> the main technique is to extend the exhale. Uh, it's 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 not on account you do it until the end of the exhale as much as you possibly can and then have a relaxed inhale uh and then you repeat this um 
and that mm. that that's been one of the most powerful uh certainly breathing techniques that i've done if not meditation techniques broadly and um mm. it's mm. interesting to kind of hear the the theory behind why that might work so well yeah Mm, that's interesting for me to hear. I actually <clears throat> wasn't aware that breathing was part of some Zen Zen tradition meditations. I, uh, it's it's critical. Uh, uh, that's, that, yes. that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah th there's, th there's also something around the the very the very bottom of the exhale. The, the diaphragm can lift up, and you can uh, you kind of like push. Um, you access the pelvic floor, and again in the pelvic floor there are a lot of these parasympathetic. Um, nerve endings and so it really allows for that deeper relaxation response which can also be you know triggering for some people too who whose bodies have learned n not to be able to access the, those states of relaxation because there have been times in their life when it's not safe and so for those people kind of really going into these states slowly and just reminding themselves that they're safe in their body they're safe to feel um, it's it's kind of a very it's a gentle process yeah that makes sense uh that technique is is quite intense and uh, it can be physically intense and also emotionally intense in a variety of ways and mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, be be careful with that one at home and and maybe maybe work with a teacher that's that's qualified if you decide to try it but uh, just for mm -hmm. the for the listener but um, yeah I can definitely bring up lots of stuff um, yeah I'd be curious to ask about. Um, Mm. I noticed that you, this is something that comes up for me when engaging with this material is like, sometimes um, it's hard to like, remember all of the sort of theory behind things and uh, like, see how it all fits together. And I know there can be sort of like an eyes, eyes glazing over type effect. And like, what helps you sort of connect the different uh, theoretical points in your mind or like, make sense of the territory, uh, if that makes sense. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? Like, what do you, or, or give me an example of what you're, what you mean? I know that I know. So I know that in the, um, things that I am very familiar with, I have sort of like internal conceptual frameworks for, uh, like being familiar with the territory of like, oh yeah, this is connected to that. And this is connected to that and new information mm -hmm. can kind of be interpreted in the light of the, the like different models that I have in my head. And I mm -hmm. sense that uh, one of the things that you're trying to do with the course is like give people those models and uh, help them mm -hmm. make sense of the territory. And there's just a lot of a lot of information about the nervous system out there. And like, mm -hmm. it's hard to discern like what what the critical things are or how they relate. And um, mm -hmm. I'd be curious what the sort of like foundational key things are to the extent that you're aware of like oh yeah this is how i'm kind of interpreting and and relating all these things yeah um so one one piece that comes to mind and this is something that is from dr stephen porge is polyvagal theory mm -hmm. and i think that for me has been a kind of critical piece in my in my understanding of the nervous system and specifically because I've been able to relate it to my own lived experiences. And so the, the, the abridged version is that there are kind of three, n not two, but three main branches of the nervous system. There's the, the sympathetic, which we've kind of talked about, most people are familiar with. And then the, there are two branches of the parasympathetic. There's the ventral and then there's the dorsal. Uh, the ventral is associated with kind of social activity. It's associated with, um, with play, for example, um, it's like when essentially when we feel safe in our bodies is kind of when the ventral is is activated um, and then on the other hand there's the dorsal which is active during deep states of, of states of deep rest and, and sleep but when the dorsal is kind of over activated it creates this kind of shutdown which is our bodies um, it's almost like like I think of it like like a fuse a fuse breaker like if there's so much intensity in in the wirings of our nervous system, if there's so much energy moving through, the fuse will just like flip and the dorsal will activate and we'll just disassociate. And you can imagine why this would be useful for kind of our, our cave dwelling ancestors, you know, if they're in the in the in the jaws of a tiger, <laughs> then like you don't want to be feeling everything in your body. Um and so it's it's a it's a very useful evolutionary response. But 
it it enabled me to reflect back to all of the times like, like we mentioned in my burnout experience previously when I had felt disassociated or disconnected from my body and so um, for me the journey has been almost, almost like retraining the ventral it, it's known as the ventral break and it's essentially um, the, the, the dorsal is very I, I, I like the the image of like a, a handbrake in a car is like the dorsal but the the, the regular foot brake is like the ventral so the foot brake allows us to kind of like during our day just like have these little kind of pauses and slow down we don't want to be constantly like going at 60 miles an hour and then slamming the handbrake on <laughs> like mm. that's that's not going to be that's not going to be helpful and that's honestly what burnout is to some degree it's like someone who is going at 60 or 100 miles an hour and to the point where their body's like this is fucking crazy and then it slams on the handbrake and that's burnout um and so the process of uh, retraining the nervous system is literally retraining the capacity for the ventral vagal braking system hmm. Hmm. and um, and this is primarily associated with uh, both b allowing breath into the kind of the belly and the pelvic floor um, and also feelings of safety in the body around kind of resting and and, and there's often you know experiences that people have people have had when it hasn't it literally hasn't been safe for them to to rest and to switch off and so they have learned that in order to stay safe to stay to stay alive they need to be in this activated productive state the entire time um, and so it makes sense as to like why their body has developed a strategy to to do that but then at a certain point, there's a recognition of like, okay, this, this strategy might have served me 20 years ago, but it's no longer serving me now. So we need to remember how to activate this other deep part of our nervous system. Mm. In that metaphor of like the brakes and the hand brakes, is there something that you would uh, squeeze the, the sympathetic nervous system in as that metaphor? Like, would it be equivalent to the gas or something else? Yeah, or, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the sympathetic is the, is the gas for sure. And if I'm remembering correctly from the course, would you say, like, it's not like the sympathetic nervous system is bad. It gives us energy and excitement or something, but it, it, oh, it's, it's it, we would want essential. it to be taxed. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely essential. And, and honestly, um, like what, what tends to happen for people who've been through burnout is when they're in dorsal, um, they'll, they'll be unable to access the sympathetic. Like that's when you're unable to get out of bed, when you're mm -hmm. unable to do the things. And usually what happens is, people will spike back into high tone sympathetic um, when they kind of so they go from like disconnection depression into anxiety and then they kind of they oscillate back down again and there's almost these like these swings into super high tone sympathetic and then high tone dorsal and gradually over time those swings get less and less intense and they fall back into what's known as their window of tolerance but yeah as you say i mean having access to and and, and, and i think this is this is actually a really important point that what what i'm hoping to share and what what we're training is is dynamism it's like full capacity to be at any end of the spectrum and that there are times when we want to be able to go like super high tone like we want to be able to to sprint we want to be able to like go on these creative and creativity creativity is a combination of sympathetic activation with the ventral as is play as is mm you know um from, as like like flow state for example like surfing is like super high tone sympathetic but with the ventral with the relaxed mm. kind of focus as well so and and, and dorsal itself isn't bad either like it mm -hmm. helps us get into these like really deep stages of of rest and relaxation but it's just when it's being used as like a fuse switch or, or a handbrake that it causes problems and and, and again the problem is is really when we get stuck in any one of these phases hmm. um like when we get stuck in the heightened sympathetic when we're constantly angry or anxious and we can't drop down into parasympathetic or when we get stuck in the dorsal and we can't get out of bed in the mornings um so it's really facilitating fluidity in in all of these systems beautiful yeah yeah i can see how that model would sort of uh help you sort of fit different uh techniques or on like facts or research into that and, and kind of mm -hmm. make sense of things. So thank you for yeah. describing it so clearly. Um, yeah, uh, with respect to the course, like since it was the first cohort of it, was there anything that you learned from running the course this time that you might, uh, that surprised you or that you might change for next time or anything like that? 
Yeah, there was, um, there's a lot. I mean, uh, it was my first kind of official online course that I ran. And so mm -hmm. there was certainly a lot of learnings for me behind the scenes in terms of creating systems, in terms of seeking more help and support early on, um, in terms of, uh, I think also simplifying. I think I had a tendency to try and share everything. You know, like I, I, f I find this stuff fascinating and I've gone quite deep. And so I wanted to like, give people you know their, their money's worth essentially by like here is all of this mm -hmm. <coughs> information um, and I think one of my reflections has been that firstly people learn in different ways some people are like me they kind of really want a lot of the nitty-gritty neuroscience and others are much more like I just don't feel great I, w I want to know how I can like just give me the tools to like to help, help change how I feel um, and so giving people different tracks for learning some people like to learn in groups um, some people love the discord some people hate the discord community it feels overwhelming some mm. people like the learning pods some people didn't engage with learning pods um they prefer to learn on their own and, and i think as an overarching principle for me um i love this quote from the uh the asaro tribe of papua new guinea and they say knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in the muscle mm. and i think um in version one there was perhaps too much emphasis on the information and I, I need to work on how to both share that through the lens of stories imagery um, visual metaphors but also even more emphasis on the kind of embodied wisdom and the the practical applications of this because that's what that's ultimately what is going to like make the difference for, for people's lives um, and and so I'm going to be kind of going back to the drawing board to some degree in in January and February and just like re really kind of thinking, okay, how can this this program kind of provide the most meaningful long-term transformation for people mm. um, with, with regards to this? Um, but in, in, in terms of what surprised me, um, this wasn't necessarily a surprise, but I, I loved the, the depth of the enthusiasm and engagement and curiosity that came from the students and just like the thoughtfulness and the quality of the questions and some of the reflections that people were, were sharing was it was super meaningful to me and really it really helped it felt very rewarding to kind mm -hmm. of um kind of help play a part in facilitating those connections and friendships that formed as well absolutely absolutely yeah it seems like it was a, a great first cohort like it, it was an incredibly professional for a first run and uh yeah, I, I think the process of iteration on these courses is really interesting. So I'll be mm. curious to hear how you sort of evolve it in the months and years to come. Um, yeah, another question I wanted to ask you as well is like on the research side, it's very clear that the course uh, comes from, you know, you having done extensive research yourself, both, um, you know, reading the scientific literature, but also applying what you found for yourself uh, pragmatically in your own experience with your own body and so on. Um, what, what would you tell someone who's interested in doing the, both that kind of research and as well, I guess the, the sort of, um, being your own guinea pig kind of thing with your own body, like, mm. uh, mm -hmm. what would you tell someone about doing that research and those experiments? Yeah, well, I think it would depend on, um, what is their like driving curiosity or driving question? I think mm. for me, a lot of it was driven by my own deep curiosity and desire to learn and experience these things for myself. Mm -hmm. um, my, I, th for me, the kind of neuroscience piece came in through, initially through a meditation teacher training that I did a few years ago. And then um, it was honestly more engaging with the breathwork side of things. And I, there's a teacher I have here called Ed Dangerfield who um, spent kind of, he, he was in an, an avalanche and he then discovered breathwork as a, as a way of, for him completing that near-death experience. And his brain, I think, works quite similar to mine in that it, it just, uh, he, he did a deep, deep dive into the neuroscience literature and we just had a lot of conversations and a lot of, um, I think a lot of my learnings initially came from him. And there've, there've also been a handful of great books that I've, I've kind of come across um, some that I'd really recommend to listeners uh, depending on how deep they want to go I'd say that they kind of like 
the the dipping your toe in the water is like the James Nestor Breathe. That's a kind of very good like entry level book. Um, for people interested in the protocols and the the functional breathing practices, then Patrick McEwen's The Breathing Cure is fantastic. And for people that want to do a deep dive into um, the more therapeutic aspect of uh, processing deep emotions, traumas, incomplete reflexes, then there's a book called Nurturing Resilience by Kathy Kane that is super, super detailed. And th this kind of unpacks the, you know, the specific childhood incomplete reflexes that can come through in a therapeutic setting. And it's, it goes really, really deep. Um, and then maybe the, f the fourth one is Widen the Window by Liz Stanley. And that's, um, that's also a really good primer on some of the, the mechanisms around resilience. And she was, um, she kind of worked in, in the military for a while and she's had a very intense life. And it's also kind of told really well. Um, so th those would be some books. And, and I think also, honestly, podcasts. I think podcasts are a really great way of getting, um, getting the gist of like a lot of this information. And you can also listen to them when you're you know, walking around the house, um, doing other things. And so there's actually, there's two episodes that I'd recommend that were on, on Curious Humans. One is with Joe Hudson, which is around emotional fluidity. And he's, um, he teaches a course called, called The Art of Accomplishment, but it's really around kind of uh, creating emotional fluidity in your life. And then the other conversation I recorded was with my friend Co uh, Connie, and that was around the neuroscience of breathing and breath work and kind of going into, into that side of things. Um, so I, I think those are probably two good starting points. And then <laughs> just tuning into like, what is it that you're most interested in? And like, what problems are you looking to solve in your own life? Mm. And running, and f from a kind of um, embodied point of view, I think it's about running experiments, or at least I have this kind of experimental mindset where I, I just like to try lots of things and just kind of see what works, see how I feel, um, see what new questions come from those experiences. And doing the the three month breathwork training here in Bali has given me a a much greater kind of embodied understanding of what is happening in the nervous system and being able to see in people's breathing when they're in dorsal shutdown, when they're in heightened sympathetic, where the breath is unable to go and, and helping using body work to facilitate the repatterning of their breath. And these patterns of breath correlate to certain emotions and certain patterns of behavior. Um, so, so by literally kind of changing how people breathe during the session, we're influencing um, how they breathe and therefore how they show up in life outside of the, the breathwork practices. Mm. When you're exploring the scientific literature on these topics, is there anything that's like helped you make sense of um, or get a sense of what is uh, like useful, relevant, true, good information and anything that's kind of like, uh, this seems flimsy or not that helpful or uh, thin mm. or something like that. H have you developed any kind of heuristics for uh, sorting out the wheat from the chaff with scientific research? Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, there's certain people that I follow that I kind of I really trust them to kind of do the due diligence in terms mm. of share. So someone like Andrew Huberman, I think is fantastic. Mm. I think his, his podcast is just really, really superb in terms of digesting a lot of a very wide range of topics related to the nervous system in a way that is compelling engaging but also steeped in research and, and like legit research too um in terms of the this the literature itself there are certain journals that tend to be kind of more reputable more trustworthy than, than others um usually you know if there's like f m at least kind of five or six papers kind of backing up a similar thing then that you know helps it to be more credible mm. and then honestly just like can i validate this in my own lived experience to some degree like some of the um papers looking at things that affect heart rate variability like can i do the same practices and does it help my heart rate var variability go up like is that mm. um does that work in my own life so that's that's generally kind of my pr and, and then sometimes i'll like try something myself or my friend will tell me something and then i'll be like oh i wonder if there's any science to kind of back this up as well Mm. Um, so it's kind of like a bi-directional like, mm. relationship.
And when you're trying all these different experiments, uh, like, are there any kind of uh, like guardrails that you put on yourself to make sure that they're safe for you or you're not hurting yourself or anything like that? Like, how do you approach that, the safety of doing these experiments on yourself? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, I've, I've created quite a, I've created a very large window of tolerance for myself in the last four years mm. by virtue of of a number of vipassana meditation retreats plant medicine ceremonies breath work I, I think i've created that capacity um so i am hesitant at times of recommending some of the things that i do because of just the nature of my nervous system but for certain people who are who have smaller windows of tolerance um there is definitely a process of, of what's known as titration or, or pendulation and that basically just means like going to the edge of your capacity and maybe like one or two percent beyond but no more and and the the art is really kind of finding out where your edge is and then just like briefly kind of like softening nudging into that um and so yeah i mean this this it's it's so contextual for some people um an, an mdma guided therapeutic session might be amazing for others it might not be the right thing um for some people it 10 day vipassana meditation will be transformative others it might send them into psychosis you know it, it's such a it's such a personal thing um I, th I think and again like it really comes down to the thing of interoception like no one can tell you what is right for you you have to kind of listen to and trust your body and, tr and trust the wisdom of your body to to know what is right and to know when you've pushed too far mm. Mm. yeah that makes a lot of sense uh, safety is such a recurring question and it's like at the end of the day you're you are responsible for yourself and what you do and how you engage mm -hmm. with these different materials and like i think it's prudent on the teaching side to like put warning labels on things and kind of like tell 100%. people about it but um at the end of the day like people have to decide for themselves what's what's best for them or if something's helpful or not yeah and, and i just add one thing to that as well that um especially if you're kind of in the beginning of exploring some of these more somatic practices, then having someone else, ideally a kind of trained trauma aware therapist to mm. co-regulate with is really, really important. Because when, when we're like going past the edge of our window of tolerance, when we're emotionally flooding, having another nervous system helps us to literally co-regulate mm. and down-regulate. So if you're, if someone who is grounded, who isn't triggered by whatever you're going through, is has a stable presence that will help your nervous system to then drop down into that state and to feel safe there. Mm. Um, so I think that's also something really important to, to mention. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. Um, I know that the, you mentioned that the wearables were kind of something that you recommend and uh, something that was kind of a pillar of the course as well. If people, it was optional, but if people wanted to try the wearables to, to sort of, get measured feedback on how these things are affecting you. Um, I'd be curious to ask, like, if you have a sense of, like wearables are still pretty new uh, as a thing. And like, I've, I'd be curious if you have a sense of like where those might be going or what might be possible in the future with wearables that's not possible now or anything like that, yeah. indications of the future with that technology. Mm. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, I've, I've tried a number of them. Um, the one that I've kind of, I use myself is the Aura Ring, which mm -hmm. I think is both the, like the least invasive and also has some of the best kind of, um, the best measurability in terms of tracking heart rate, heart rate variability and sleep. The, the sleep one is still, I think that, you know, they're still working on it to some degree, but I know that the heart rate variability, which is for me, I think the most interesting measurement because it's almost like a proxy for our resilience our heart rate variability is to what degree can we um, switch between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic on a kind of regular basis so can mm. we go from being like super activated running around to then resting deeply like pretty quickly like that's kind of what it's what it's measuring um, and so for me that is that that's the most helpful metric to look at and but to look at the, the baseline kind of over a period of, of a week or so and particularly like when you're resting as well because it does it fluctuates during the day so i think for people starting out that's 
it's not perfect, but that's the most interesting number to pay attention to. Um, and then in, in terms of where it's going, I think, I think there are some interesting innovations around combining data using AI and things like that to notice trends and to kind of bring to your awareness, like when you do X or Y, then your heart rate variability plummets or it goes up. And so you're able to identify kind of patterns of behavior or things in your life which, which affect it that might be otherwise in your blind spots. Mm. Um, the, new, the new Aura, which actually just arrived yesterday for me, um, also measures SpO2, so it measures your oxygen levels, um, which is also, again, helpful like indicator if, if you're breathing, if you're breathing well, if you're getting enough oxygen in your body. Um, I'm actually joining a breath lab here in Bali and we're going to be importing some kernel brain scanners, which are, uh, they cost like $50,000 each. Um, but we're hoping to get fMRI data on what, what is happening during breath work. Mm. Um, and hopefully also CO2 levels, because what, what really um, makes the difference in breathwork journeys is the relationship between CO2 to O2 levels. And so understanding what is happening with someone's breathing pattern, what their respective O2 CO2 levels are, and also what's going on inside their brain will help us like really get a sense of, of what is going on in, in these journeys. So that's, that's really interesting for me. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I honestly think that in some ways wearables also can be a crutch, right? They're really helpful in the beginning, but ultimately you want to just be able to listen and tune into your body and trust that. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the wearables can, can risk being a thing that you just, um, you, you, you almost like outsource your interception to a, an aura ring or something. <laughs> mm. So I, I think it is, it's definitely a balance. But for me, I think just for someone looking to get started, just something like an aura ring, Apple Watch is also, is also pretty good. Um, and then HRV being kind of the main metric to, to look at. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know, I, I think um, I was just talking to someone today about, um, this is something I'd be curious about on my end, but like about, uh, mm, they were talking about how it's sort of possible to track, I forget what the exact tool was that they were talking about, but like there was some tool that they were using that could track the difference between say doing a Vipassana technique versus like meta or a heart-based approach. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. how there could be some really interesting applications on the meta side for helping someone get the hang of the technique and deepen in the technique. And uh, Mm -hmm. we're sort of bouncing off ideas of what that could look like. And uh, Mm -hmm. that's something that I continue to be curious about. So yeah that's that's super interesting and i i I also have the the muse headband as well which Mm -hmm. um is it's super interesting technology the the, like its current accuracy i'm still like just not entirely sure of but Mm -hmm. i think the way that's going like when we're able to really tune into like the different brainwave states that we're in and and maybe also the different like frequencies coming from a heart and correlating the two so there's the heart brain coherence i think that's um that's also some really interesting technology as well Definitely, definitely. Yeah, the, I've used the Muse before in an earlier iteration. I don't think the most recent one, but it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, and I, I've tried a few other things like that and uh, still seems like pretty early days with what might be possible there. Um, totally, yeah. Is there anything uh, that we've talked about that you'd like to dive more deeply into or anything that else that you'd like to talk about? Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about, um, firstly, kind of your, your experiences kind of on this journey for yourself of like increasing your own resilience, increasing your own kind of nervous system capacity and insights that have come both maybe from the course, but also from other practices. And yeah, like now that you just mentioned Meta a moment ago, and I think I'm also interested in um, in that question around like cultivating joy, loving kindness within ourselves and the relationship between that and 
our resilience because they are related and it's um and, and I, I did a meta retreat a few years ago at spirit rock that was really really profound for me um but i'm still exploring the relationship between the two i think mm, mm, yeah yeah me too and i i think it's making me aware too that this is something i've been curious about for some time but i know very little about but like i don't know much about the the sort of like a, a nervous system perspective on what's happening with meta i mostly mm -hmm. know uh how it's been taught and uh what my own experience of it is but i would be very curious to uh mm. learn more about what's happening in the nervous system there and i know some mm -hmm. people that are doing research on that sort of thing but i i'm really quite ignorant of it so uh that's something i'd like to learn more about yeah um yeah but i think i mean there, this is like such an impoverished model but i think uh one way that i it's it's a practical one um that I think about it is like through meta, you can intentionally cultivate certain emotional states, really a broad, a broad suite of emotions. It's not just like one, one specific mm -hmm. emotion. It's like a wide range of positive emotions. And, and even theoretically you could cultivate negative emotions if you wanted to, but I wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. recommend that, but um, you can create, basically it's like creating feedback loops such that certain emotions or mind states, uh, replicate and grow and uh, you can do that with feelings of happiness and love and connection and um mm -hmm. yeah i think like one way that i framed it in the past is like i mean because it's not it's not like that makes um difficult experiences disappear or like problems in your life disappear or excuse me <laughs> um like we still have other difficult experiences there are still problems in the world but you're sort of at i mean uh adding spaciousness to that insofar as you're adding other positive emotions into the mix and like i get mm -hmm. an image often of like making a pond with like beautiful water and then there's still like rocks in the bottom of the pond it's like you don't make mm -hmm. the rocks disappear but you mm -hmm. can add water to the pond and, and make it beautiful in that way um mm -hmm. and then from there it's like oh yeah the rocks aren't so bad there's still you know grief or um or anger or uh you know confusion or fear or any number of experiences that might be difficult or challenging to experience. But if you also mm -hmm. can access a, a, a huge pool of love at any time, uh, mm. it's not so bad. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually have, to have some thoughts, thoughts on that. Um, mm -hmm. my, my sense of what I've been experiencing in, in breath work is what's, what's really happening is a combination of presence and like loving awareness or acceptance is being brought to the parts of ourselves which we've previously like exiled or we've been afraid mm -hmm. to look at mm -hmm. so, through a certain breathing pattern. So breathing into the pelvis, for example, will often elicit um, the sensation of shame or, or the, the, the sensation that then we then label as the emotion of shame. And if you can be <clears throat> in, in a kind of open hearted space and stay present with that, it kind of dissolves, it alchemizes, it, it transmutes. Um, and, and the same is true of, of um, like sexual trauma as well. Like these, these <clears throat> things that we've stored in our nervous system to be processed later, it's almost like they require, wh when they're dredged up, they require the safety, the presence and the loving awareness um, in order to be seen and then like brought back into who we are. Mm. Um, and, and so I, I, I feel like meta is like, it's like a meta skill in the sense of um, if you can cultivate that, then no emotion, feeling, sensa sensation that comes up um, is, is bad because it will help it to kind of run its cycle. It will help it to move its course and maybe even the energy, like I've experienced the, the energy of anger then turning into the energy of love and the energy of connection. It's like that energy just moves through your system. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I think, I think a really important part of that is like directing that love towards yourself and the different aspects that are coming up and like, um, yeah. you know, um, oh, I was thinking about this actually earlier in our conversation of like, um, 
like this is something I do so often, but like there was a, a question that I like slightly stumbled on my words, which which happens occasionally. And it's like, oh, I just like blasted myself with love, like no problem, you know, totally, <laughs> totally normal. It's just a turn of phrase, like it's going fine. Mm -hmm. And like, I, it, it, that's not, it's not even verbal, but that's the kind of attitude. It's just like, oh, have some self love, no problem, man. You know, <laughs> everything's fine. And like, that's something I can summon in these mm -hmm. situations. And uh, uh -huh. anyway. yeah, uh, there's still, you know, you're still working with whatever the situation is, but you can just, yeah, it's, it's really useful to be able to love on yourself a lot. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah, so, something else that I'm, I'm curious to ask you about as well is like <clears throat> your, and I'm sure you've talked about this on the podcast previously, but your transition from living at, at Maple and the monastic Academy to kind of forging your own path to some degree. Mm -hmm. And, I'm interested in what that transition has been like for, from you and also like what were some of the the benefits and skills that you felt like you really took away from the experience at Maple. I mean, mm. and, and I say that as someone who's considered moving and spending time at Maple myself. So it's mm -hmm. something that I'm, I'm curious about. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll take those in the reverse order just because they're okay. that, that, the, that's sort of the chrono chronology of it. But um yeah, I think, I think, of course, I, I went to Maple to deepen in my meditation practice. Originally, I went twice, and that was sort of my original intention. And that certainly happened. So there are all kinds of like, skills that I gained on the contemplative practice side of like, uh, you know, just, um, I could go into this at some like, but you know, like being able to concentrate for or, um, you know, being able to, uh, yeah, like love myself, I, did, I developed a loving kindness practice or any number of other things that are, uh, sort of like features of my perception and experience at this point. Um, so I definitely mm -hmm. deepened in the meditation, but then, you know, it's also a leadership training program. So there are all mm -hmm. kinds of like practical skills that I learned about, uh, you know, uh, getting work done and coordinating with other people and, uh, you know, executing on projects that, uh, yeah, just developed like a robust ability to like act effectively and get my projects done and work with other people and uh, a lot of specific experiences in those skills and getting mm. projects done and um, actually making things happen in the world. And so that's mm. been really useful, but both of those things, you know, having a practice, being able to, you know, execute on things in the world, um, both of those, you know, I could, I could speak at more length about, but that's kind of the broad picture. And then, um, yeah, what has the transition been like? Um, you know, it's interesting because it's almost like uh, I, I valued the work that I was doing there. I valued the organization quite a bit, uh, wanted to help them, believed in their mission. And mm -hmm. uh, I was also, especially in the last like two, one and a half, two years that I was there, uh, I was also like in parallel working on my own projects and like writing blog posts and having a Twitter presence and writing an email newsletter and things like that. And um I was always doing that in my free time, you know, there's like two and a half hours two two and a half hour break every day. And then like one day off a week or maybe two days sometimes. Uh, and I was like, that's, I would work on my own stuff during those days. And mm -hmm. on the other days I would, uh, be working for the monastery. And, uh, so I was like working, I still do this actually. I work every, pretty much every day, but like I was sort of had two jobs, <laughs> my own job mm -hmm. and then the monastery job. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and training full time and getting very little sleep. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, this is just one frame on it, but I was really seeing the value in the projects I myself was doing and both that they were helping the world and that they were more like enlivening for me. Uh, mm -hmm. like, Hey, these are projects that I conceived of that like use my skills that are helping people. And, uh, it just felt like that was the direction to go in and, sort of had a similar thing after I left where like initially I was like, oh, I'll get a job and, uh, you know, an apartment and a car and whatnot. And uh, started, I started working briefly for, for an organization and again, really valued their work, valued the mission. Uh, my skills were being well used there. Uh, and still it was like, oh, like my projects are kicking off even more. And like, these are still more exciting for me and more lively. Mm -hmm. And I think they're helping the world more directly. And uh, so I was like, okay, I have to, I have to like, basically work for myself, uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, do my own projects. And, um, so I'm still using all of the skills that I learned there. I think the projects that I'm doing are like pretty sympathetic to the things that they're working on there, certainly inspired by my time there, but, um, mm -hmm. it's felt good to 
I am getting like an, an image almost of like, there's just this like hose of power that I unleashed there of like mm. skills and ability. And it's like, okay, Amazing. now I need to like steer the hose in a good direction instead yeah, of like yeah, yeah. splitting it in multiple, <laughs> you know, yeah. streams. And uh, yeah, that, it's totally. felt good to be like, okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to totally. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I really resonate with that hose metaphor in the sense of having curious humans it kind of by nature, I, my hose was in like 10 different directions. And so, mm -hmm nervous system mastery was the first time that i was like okay for the next few months i'm gonna just like really direct all of my energy creativity and attention in this in this direction mm -hmm. um and there's a real uh, like it feels very rewarding to kind of go deep in a certain area mm. um, interesting yeah that's how i felt too huh yeah i'm, I'm sort of uh internally blushing because uh it's like oh I, I i still the hose is still going strong in multiple directions but they're all yeah. all my directions so but, <laughs> but i like i like juggling different things and uh there seem to be synergy between the different things that i'm doing so mm -hmm. i don't know mm -hmm. maybe at some point it would make sense to like be like oh exclusively focus on this one thing but for now yeah. it seems good to kind of be juggling multiple multiple different kinds of projects and that's actually yeah. um you know I, I was thinking about this because it seems like one of the keys to preventing burnout is resting. And mm. uh, I wonder sometimes about, like effectively I work every day uh, mm -hmm. and I, I've done that for probably years at this point. And mm. it's like, well, is that healthy? Is it sustainable? But like, at least in my own experience of it, we'll see how this pans out, how this pans out with the test of time. But like internally it feels sustainable and I think part of that is because I'm doing different things where like, I basically do the thing that is motivating to me at a given mm -hmm. time. And there's, I've built in a lot of slack such that like, you know, I don't have to work on something if I'm not in the mood to do it. And, and there's so many different kinds of things that I do that it's not like, oh, I'm just writing every day, for example, or I'm just reading every day, or I'm just teaching meditation every day. There's a lot of variety and like, circulation mm -hmm. of what i'm doing such that they're like everything is a rest from something else in a certain mm. way if that makes mm. sense mm -hmm. yeah y yeah i i think um my reflection on that is well firstly it, it i think it depends on how you define work mm. and one's relationship to it and and also where the impetus is is like truly coming from on a deep level like is it um is it on some deep level like we're trying to prove that we're worthy mm. uh, to the world and to be seen in that way or is there just like this deep sense of joy and this like overflow of creativity and this thing that wants to kind of be birthed into the world mm. but i think even from that place i do believe that we kind of go through these these cycles and that having time kind of particularly time in nature time away from technology to a large degree um to like reset our dopamine levels for a start and to kind mm. of like Re re regulate. Um, I think, I, I think that being in that mode of creation is like trying to be in summer the whole or spring the whole time. Mm. Like I think we do have these like these seasons, mm. um, and it is different for everyone. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's like both both and. <laughs> mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll be chewing on that as a as a kind of question for myself of what what the skillful thing to do is there and. I know I have a just practically I know I'm, I'll be sitting a retreat next year uh, which mm -hmm. will be good and uh, that hopefully will be kind of a break point and uh, mm -hmm. other things like that so uh, mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting reflection I'll keep chewing on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there anything else that you'd like to speak more about or, or talk more about um Do you have any reflections or ideas for me? Like for, I'm going to be in, in February and March kind of really thinking about how, how I can spend my time most effectively and how I can shift or change the course to make it even more impactful. Is there anything that comes to mind for you as, as questions to explore or of things that you might have appreciated during the course or... Uh, is anything that comes to mind mm. well i really liked the course and i think it would be if someone's interested in taking it i would recommend them it did feel like a first definitely a first run and uh it was extremely polished in terms of like 
the the execution of it and the information and so on that like that didn't feel like a first uh round which was quite impressive but um i think there were the things that it felt like um and hopefully i mean people people in the, that are watching this probably know this of like if you take i like to take the first cohort of a course and it's like if mm -hmm. you do that it's like you should have a lot of patience for the people in the like first second even third cohorts of like you know there's mm -hmm. a lot that's being worked out and um you know, if it's like the fifth or sixth cohort of a course and, you know, they're charging you uh, $2,000 or something, I don't know what some of these courses I think are ridiculously priced, but um, yeah. that's just me. But, um, you know, maybe you should expect more polish. But for me, it's like, oh, like, I, I'm just here to get in as early as I can and learn what I can as early as I can. And um, it's like very uh expected that there would be like bumps or something and i so i was surprised that there were no like real like oh things didn't work or like the information was janky or something um the thing that stuck out to me was like one i, I think i was like i wasn't aware going in of like what the structure of the course would be and i was like surprised mm -hmm. at how much uh how much material there was and like what how much like what the commitment level of commitment was to mm -hmm, engaging mm -hmm. with the practices of like meeting in groups and uh yeah. listening to podcasts and doing practices and like just to, mm -hmm. like whatever structure you end up deciding I, it would be useful to know like in advance like this is what you will be doing or like totally. here's the yeah. recommended things of like it's going to take you i think fully doing what was in the first cohort would have taken like I don't know, five, six hours a week or something of work. And like, I ended yep. up doing like two hours a week probably. Um, yep. And uh, that's fine to like scale something, but it'd be good to know. Like I ended up shifting to like, okay, my goal is just to like digest the course material. So I understand the content and then I can apply it at my own pace later. Um, yeah, got it. But um, yeah. And I think, um, I think I was interested in both the theory and the practice, but it was overwhelming to do them both at the same time. And mm -hmm. I wonder if some people would be um, like just interested in one, if you could structure it for them to like, just mm -hmm. get one. And then if they are doing both, like five weeks seems pretty fast to do both. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the goal is to have both like uh, slowing it down might be useful then again like a longer time commitment is harder for people so i know there's a bunch of trade-offs here but it did feel like yeah, a lot yeah. of stuff in five weeks yeah. to do fully and at a certain point i was like oh i'm not going to be able to do this fully so okay yeah, yeah, yeah. i will love yeah. myself regardless <laughs> 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 yes. like, no one's going to be mad at me this isn't school uh, i'm not like failing or something so um yeah i think that's what comes to mind uh you know yeah Cool. Yeah, that's that's really helpful to hear. And I think, I think the approach that I might end up taking is is more of like making some of the stuff, maybe like twenty five percent of it. Kind of this is core, like this is essential, mm -hmm. and then having optional add ons mm -hmm. for people that want to go really deep in the theory, for people that want to like maybe have the learning pods and just have these kind of like bolt on things, mm -hmm. which um, will be extra commitments, but things that they've explicitly signed up for. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Someone dropped out of my learning pod, like right after we scheduled something and then, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. So it was like a learning pod of like two people and, and th that was, <laughs> that wasn't great. So, uh, yeah, I think it would be great if people were like, yes, I do want to do a learning pod. Like this is the thing that I want or like, oh, I don't have time for it. And, um, yeah, that, that seems like a good idea too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the feedback and also for participating in your your awesome contributions to the community as well it's yeah really yeah awesome. my pleasure it was a blast and uh yeah totally totally like i don't know uh all of that is coming from a place of like oh yeah it's the first cohort that's just what it was like for me so i know it, it, it's kind of fun to tinker on these things and see how they evolve and just like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i'll be curious to see what you do with it but um yeah well thank you so much for talking to me today it's great to learn more about you and your work and uh, i i mm. enjoyed the course and i hope other people do too in the future and uh, look forward to seeing where you go with it amazing well yeah thank you so much for reaching out and this has been it's been really fun for me as well um yeah i look forward to staying in touch and seeing where your your highs of creation uh, <laughs> leads you <laughs> amen where it leads us both <laughs> all right take care